All right, Dasha. Hi. Dasha, where are you from? Where did you grow up? Um, I was born and raised in Ukraine. Ukraine. Tell me about your family growing up. You had mom and dad? Um, yeah, I was very fortunate to have a really beautiful life in Ukraine. Um, I was really bitter when I had to immigrate. Um, what age? Uh, six, seven, around there. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I got to see almost my entire family, like almost weekly, if not daily. Um, they all played a really huge you know, part in raising me. I was born in a village. Um, we were the only village, uh, the only house in the village who, that had a cow. So, you know, we had a lot of people kind of coming in and out and, um, you know, buying vegetables from us. And um, yeah, it was really, like we were very poor, but it was a really rich life. Um, I was just really lucky to have a lot of love around me. Um, and it kind of changed when I moved to the States. Um, I, you know, I still had my parents, but I felt a little lonelier because I didn't have my whole extended family, which I was just really attached to. Um, and I still am. Um, and obviously given like what's happening in the country right now, it makes it even more difficult. Um, which is uh, something I don't really talk a lot about. I like to, you know, I like to shed awareness on things that are going on, but I never really talk about what's happening in my family. Um, how, how bad is it for them? It's, um, it's not great. We, we lost someone. Um, you know, it's really close to home for me. Um, my, um, I have two family members who are in the army um, and my cousin's husband is one of them and he got hit by a Russian missile. Um, It's been about a year since he's been gone. Um, Yeah, this isn't something that's, it wasn't surprising to us. My my grandmother has survived two famines. Um, You know, because of all of this, it's kind of in the history of being Ukrainian is kind of fighting, fighting them off, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I mean, I get, I get to talk to my family somewhat often. I think sometimes I feel a little, a little bad because I don't talk to them as much as I'd like to because I have to spend the whole day recuperating from talking to them because it, it hurts. Um, and it's not like, it's not like a normal traumatic event where something happens and you have to move on and process that trauma. It's just something that like you have to live with every single day and, you know, have to keep doing everything else. And I'm I'm relatively a very happy person. Um, So it just randomly something will remind me of it and then I get sad and then you just have to keep, you just have to move on. Forget about it, distract yourself. Yeah, it's in the news all the time. It is. Um, I remember I got to one point where I had to tell my gym, like, can you please stop playing this? Like, it's like every morning, like, I don't want to start my morning like this. <laughs> like, I like to start my morning in the gym because I want to, you know, have a good start to the day. Um, and having to see that is like really frustrating, especially when I'm looking at people around me and like, it's not affecting everyone else the way it affects me. So I, I don't really like to watch it. And um, my cousin promised, told, well, he wanted me to promise him that I wouldn't just like fixate on the news all the time. So I, I've decided not to, cause yeah, like there's a lot of misinformation or some things that are true and you just don't know what's what. And um, I think you just don't want to believe some of it as well. Um, so it's obviously very difficult. Um, and I've always been very patriotic, like well before this, like anytime someone was like, oh, are you, are you Russian? I'm like, no, I'm Ukrainian. Um, Well before this, um, I've always been really proud to be Ukrainian. Um, So, yeah, it was just, it was a really beautiful life. So I'm definitely bitter, for sure. Are you grateful to be in the United States? I am, of course. I mean, I love my life here. I've built a really beautiful life. Obviously, it's very unconventional, um, but I'm very proud of it. Um, How did you get introduced to doing sex work like this? So 
I think it started with me finding a passion in sex education. When I entered high school, I realized just how bad sex education is in the country and honestly all over the world. And it made me very angry. Um, and it made me want to study psychology more than anything. And so um, I moved to London and I studied um, psychology there. Um, and almost immediately, like, I wanted to go into sex therapy. That's thought, that's, that was the initial plan. Um, but I started getting curious and um, almost immediately after I moved there, I started like exploring um, the whole scene. Before I, even, before I even moved, I was really inspired by different sex workers I would follow on the internet. And I think the one thing that drew me to it more than anything was the sense of community. Like sex workers are very, very united. Um, but at the same time, like they don't stand behind people that they find problematic or bad. Um, so I just found, it just really resonated with me. Um, I think the people more than anything, and still to this day, like all of the people I looked up to are now some of my closest friends and I'm, um, I'm very proud of that. Um, but yeah, I started um, kind of exploring sugar babying first, um, which I think, you know, a lot of people are curious about. Um, and unfortunately, I do think it's a gateway to sex work. Um, but I started exploring that. And I think after a while, you get really entranced by the appeal of making someone feel good and the attention and then also, you know, getting rewarded for it. Um, so is there something about your personality, your childhood, the way you were raised that made this? I, I do think about that. You? And every, every single woman in my family is really strong and they're all slightly sadistic for sure. Um, and I've always loved that, but like in the most nurturing way. Um, and I consider myself to be a mommy dom. Um, which is just a style of domination. What, what is a mommy dom? Yeah, it's a style of domination. Um, I don't consider it particularly to be a role play, like, like some might think. Um, but I would consider it to be someone who is dominant, nurturing, maybe even a little coercive. Um, it's, it's a really fun dynamic. Um, and I've just always considered that to be me because I love being able to like mix pleasure and pain. Um, Psycho all in psychology one. comes. I know. <laughs> it's, it's, it goes hand in hand with what you do, doesn't it? It does. Um, and so many dominatrixes that I've met studied psychology, and um, I think someone needs to do a study on that because it's quite it's quite fascinating. Um, what is it about the the makeup of men that? They need to have somebody. I think. Are, are you are you abusive to them at times? I I wouldn't say I'm abusive. I mean, I think a lot of the times I provide structure for some of these people. Um, more than anything, um, why I continue to do what I do um, is it's so rewarding to see to just to see someone feel really validated. Because a lot of the times, I think femdoms and submissives are told that they're not allowed to act in this way. Um, and when you have someone that you know allows you to explore this in a in a healthy way, um, and that's not abusive, um, it just it feels like a catharsis for a lot of people. Um, because a lot of the times, what I'm exploring more than anything, because m most of the people that I've I've seen they're not engaging in extreme BDSM or, you know, anything very hardcore. It's just at the root of it, like people want to experience role reversal and men in particular, they like the idea of feeling desired, of feeling pretty. And um, I think we just don't allow men to feel that way. And I also think we don't allow women to always feel powerful. Um, and so... I feel like I'm able to give people that outlet. And for me, that just, it means the world. 
Um, and I also think that I've had a lot of women who've come to me who've experienced, you know, bad doms, for example, who have hurt their relationship with BDSM. And they'll come to me because they haven't given up on the journey, but um, they, they want to be able to heal the relationship with BDSM, which I think is um, really beautiful. And I'm, I love being able to provide that for people. Um, so give me, an, give me an example of a particularly interesting interaction that you'll have with one of your clients. Sure. Um, so a lot of the times when I, before I even see them, I will talk to them about um, like the kinks that they're interested in exploring with me in particular, um, and also the feelings that they want to achieve. So recently I saw someone who the whole goal was just to want to feel desired and slut out. And um, that is exactly what I attempted to, to do. Um, and I think with that is where like my sensuality kind of comes in because especially when you have someone pretty who um, like really shows you that they want you, um, it's very validating obviously. Um, and I think that's something that I bring to this is like a lot of authenticity. Um, you, you enjoy this. I do so much. Um, and I never really understand people who, you know, hate on what I do um, because I'm just so happy. <laughs> well, it's, it's a form of therapy, isn't it? Um, it really is. And especially if I have... Let me, let me, let me ask a frank question. Are, are, are you having sex with your clients? Um, I am not. Yeah. See, that's why I suspected. And, yeah. And so really what you're doing is therapy with maybe some spandex and some, I mean, latex <laughs> and, uh, and some whips and some boots and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's really beautiful. Um, I did at one point used to do like some independent escorting and everyone would always want me to dom. <laughs> So um, I've always had a very dominant personality. Um, everyone's always said that. From when I was little, everyone's like, Dasha is the most confident person that I've ever met. So like a lot of this, like in retrospect, makes sense. Um, but yeah, I've just, I've, I've also like offered it at times to clients. And they're always like, no thanks. And th this is <laughs> natural for you, your personality. Yeah. This is not an act you're putting on. Yes. And I think it's very hard to fake being a good dom. Um, I think there are other parts of us, like sex work that you can, you know, kind of put on a roll and kind of clock in, clock out. Um, but this is one of those things that one, like you have to be present 24 seven because if you are disassociating at any point, like the scene's not moving along because you are you are everything in this role. Like you are taking control, you are taking responsibility for any risks that are going to happen. So you need to be very, very present. Um, I think it's also kind of important not to, um, you know, have a huge volume of clients because you need to be so, um, so present. I mean, for example, if I have a, if I have a session with a couple in particular, um, most of the times I sleep for like 12 hours and I am so exhausted. I feel very euphoric for sure. Um, you get this like top high um, and I love being a top for sure. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's a lot. And after you're done, it's just like, okay, I can't do anything else but relax for the rest of the day. And um, resting is a really big part of sex work. Doesn't matter what, you know, area or aspect of sex work that you're involved in, like you really need to make sure that you're taking care of your body because um, it's very taxing at times, for sure. Are drugs a part of your life at all? No, so I'm, I'm actually like one of the like healthiest people that anyone knows. I'm, um, I've been vegan for like eight years. I, um, I don't drink at all. I don't do any drugs. Um, you know, I come from a Ukrainian family, so drinking was really, you know... You don't need to apologize for being clean. I know. <laughs> I do. 
Um, but yeah, I just like my family was always fine if I drank. Um, and I think that's what kept me from doing it. Like my, my parents have always been really supportive. Like, for example, they don't love that I do this, but um, they're always very, very supportive. Um, and they like to like joke around about it. And um, I just find it very easy. Um, and also, I think everyone in my life knows that like, I'm the type of person that like, I am very easy to cut someone off if I feel like they are not accepting what I do because I am just very stubborn in that way. Um, just like the rest of my family. So um, they just, they, they know that they have to be accepting of it because I will always do what I want. And a lot of the times I'm, I, I know how to take care of myself. Do you have a lot of regulars? Um, I do, thankfully. Um, I think I attract more than anything a lot of international clients um, because of the fact that I'm an immigrant um, and I have, you know, um, lived in multiple countries. Um, so it's really interesting, but I have regulars who don't even live in New York. Um, and who will, have, you know, they might have work here and then they try to make sure that they see me while they're, while they're here. Um, and then also some locals, which is great as well. Um, but nothing makes me happier than couples. <laughs> I love working with couples because um, the dynamic is just so unique um, and every relationship is so different. Whereas like with individuals, you can kind of expect more. What, what, what are you learning about relationships and, and men? from doing this? Um, I think more than anything that like specifically relationships, I mean, it's very difficult for me to date now because I have such a higher standard because obviously being a dom, a lot of my clients worship me and obviously that's very validating. Um, and you know, they, they bring me presents. They are just, I'm so lucky. I think I have some of the best clients, actually, but I think that also comes down to my vetting process. Um, but is being worshipped something that you would want in a, in a romantic relationship? It is. It is. Okay. It is. And this is, this is what makes relationships interesting, is they're all different kinds. I, exactly. Um, there's so many different ways to, obviously, approach a relationship. Um, and I think a lot of the times I don't approach it very conventionally, given what I do. Um, and I also... Um, I'm also a content creator, so I'm, you know, having sex on camera with other people. Um, most of the time I'm topping, but, um, you know, I can't be in a conventional relationship, nor would I, nor do I have the desire to be in that. Have you had a regular rela uh, conventional um, relationship before? No, I haven't. Um, How old are you? I, um, I'm 22. I just turned 22. Well, you're young, so. I know, I know. I have uh, a lot of time, which is... Uh, I think about a lot because I've already done so much and I'm always like, what's left? And um, somehow I find the next thing, but like I just recently bought a house. Um, I'm very proud of that. Um, so the money you're making is good. Yes, thankfully. Um, and I think, you know, there's a privilege with being able to say no to certain clients, especially like people that you don't feel comfortable working with. Um, and I do really have to thank my content creation because it supplements um, a decent chunk of my income as well. Um, so is I'm that, very- Is that OnlyFans? Yeah, OnlyFans and other subscription platforms and um, yeah, like clip sites, things like that. How, how do you compare what you do to, let's say a typical street prostitute? who is kind of doing the same thing you're doing, but probably making, sounds like, less money, not sure. saving it, doing a lot more dangerous stuff. Yeah. Um, well, so you, you seem to have found the, like, the, the top echelon of, of sexual. Yeah, I mean, I'm very lucky because um, I had a lot of people be like, oh, I think you'd be really great online, like a lot of my friends, um, because I have the personality for it. Um, and... I immediately started going on like TikTok and um, gaining a presence there and I got big very quickly um, and people liked my personality. They enjoyed the whole mommy dom aspect, um, which is very trendy at the moment as well. Um, and so it worked really well to be able to, you know, recruit 
subscribers and such and occasionally clients. Um, but I, I was just very fortunate for that because I thankfully have a business mind. Like I, I, I know how to market. I know how to, um, I pick up skills very well and very quickly. So, you know, I run my entire business top to bottom by myself. I've tried to hire people, but obviously I'm a control freak. Um, so yeah, I've just, I've learned so much from the fact that like, I just, I do everything A to Z from the marketing, thinking of concepts, editing, directing, like absolutely everything. Um, so it's, it, it's a lot, um, but not everyone has the mindset for it. And I've talked to a lot of different sex workers and some people just get into the industry simply because they like sex or they like BDSM um, and they don't particularly love the business side as much, which is understandable. Um, and there's also a lot of people in this industry. We have a lot of, you know, um, marginalized communities, like a large um, community of disabled workers, um, you know, people of color, etc., who just um, in general, obviously, like I'm privileged to be pretty and um, it just obviously makes it easier. Um, like going viral was very easy for me when I initially started. Um, algorithms are constantly changing, but I think I can't entirely talk about the life of someone working on the street, but survival, sex work is a very different. Much more you know, dangerous. Obviously, yeah, much more dangerous. And I think that comes back to the fact that. No, but like you're buying a house. Yes. And, and a lot of the sex workers I've worked that are doing a more dangerous type of work. Yeah. They're not buying houses. No, of course. They don't own cars. They don't even have an apartment. No, I know. And that's, um, yeah, no, I, I mean, I think about that all the time because. And you're not even having sex in most cases. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, there's so many aspects of sex work, and there's a lot of it that is dangerous. And I obviously, seeing in-person clients, like you're exposing yourself to danger, and being online as well, just there's there's a big stigma that comes with doing what we do. Um, but, what do your parents think of it? Um, like I said, they're very supportive. Um, again, they don't love the idea of what I do. What, what dad is going to love his daughter's doing this. Um, it's quite funny because my dad makes jokes more than, more than anyone about it. And he finds it funny. Um, and also I think my parents, like they, they, they get it. They've always been very, um, like they've never shamed me about my sexuality. Um, and I could just tell that they've always been very open, um, and probably not approaching sex the same way that other people do. Um, and I've always been really thankful for that because, I mean, you know, you hear about so many people who um, are very sexually repressed because- yeah. Americans tend to be pretty uptight. They do. Sexually, are Europeans the same way? Are Russians, Ukrainians? Definitely not. Um, you know, for example, like I feel like I can, if I'm having an issue with something, like I can go to my mom and be able to talk about it. And um, I'm really thankful for that. Like I'm very close to my parents. I talk to them multiple times a day. Um, I do really love like getting their opinion on certain things. It's obviously not in a unhealthy way. Like I would never come to them with something with something weird, but um, it's, it's really nice to be able to have like an open dialogue and be able to trust my parents. And um, yeah, I'm very lucky for that. I mean, I know not everyone has that, especially in sex work. I feel like a lot of people feel like they, they need to hide what they do. Um, but my parents have always known that like, if you, if you want to be in my life, you have to accept me fully. Um, and my mom said that from birth. She's like, she's going to do what she wants. She goes, I cannot control her. Um, but thankfully, like I have found the best path I think I could take for myself. At 22. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I know I'm much younger than I think a lot of people think that I am. Um, and especially cause like, it's been a really, it's been a long four years. Like I feel like I've accomplished so much within that time. Um, but yeah, I think also there just, there comes a security with doing online sex work more than anything. And I think a lot of us get really terrified when we see, um, you know, sex work abolitionists and uh, payment processors try to kind of shut down what we're doing because 
all you do would be sending the people who have found this safe haven, pushing it us, us out onto the streets. Making the world more dangerous. 100%. And um, that's also something I'm very, very passionate about. You, because think, you think sex work of all sorts or many, of most sorts should be uh, legalized? I do. I do. I think it's really important to decriminalize sex work. And I think it's also really important to consult sex, sex workers when you know, making any kind of legislation. Because when you look back to like FOSTA SESTA, for example, you know, they have basically turned any kind of media we consume, it doesn't matter if you are engaging in consensual sex work, they still consider it um, like soliciting or part of sex trafficking. And it's, it's just really terrifying to see that. Um, and it, I think people don't realize how much that it goes into the censorship of our media because it goes as far as taking down a girl's post just because you see the outline of her nipple through a shirt. Because anything remotely sexual, like social media platforms don't want to be seen as aiding and enabling. You don't have to tell me. Sex trafficking. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to tell I'm, me. I'm sure, yeah. I mean, anyone who's in... who's in. I mean, this, this will get demonetized for what's underneath your chin there. <laughs> yeah, I mean... It's obviously very difficult because anyone who um, has a smaller chest than me a lot of the times can get away with some of those things compared to me just because I have the chest that I have, which, you know, causes me a lot of back pain. I mean, I, I didn't choose this. You show, um, you show a, a female nipple and it'll, it'll get me in trouble, but a male nipple is fine. Exactly. And that's obviously so frustrating and it doesn't make any sense to me and it never has. Um, but yeah, it just, I think people don't really realize how how you know how the span of it and how it goes across the entire internet from actual sex workers and trying to keep us from doing what we do but also all the way to just policing women's bodies yeah no religion complicates it yes a lot of things complicate it but it's it's a mess it is a mess and obviously we have everyone from sex work abolitionists to evangelical christians all of them lobbying all pretending like they're not sexual Exactly. And it just doesn't make sense because, again, because I'm European, I think we really value women and our sexuality more than, more than I think, other parts of the world. And we, I mean, we celebrate women at the end of the day. I mean, and I just, I really appreciate that. Like, we definitely have a very strong matriarch in the family and like that's how it's always been. Um, from my grandmother to my mother, like it's just always been that way. We we put women on a pedestal, um, and I just I don't understand how we can pretend like we're not all having sex, and that you know sex doesn't create us, put us onto the world. And um, like I said, I'm very passionate about sex education because you know we can't just like leave it up to the parents all of the time because especially if you're having parents who are like no, we can't talk about that. Like, sex is evil, sex is bad. Like, don't have that until you get married. It's like, that's when you end up with people in dangerous situations and because they just weren't properly educated. And they don't understand contraception. They get coerced into bad situations. Like, that's that's terrible. Yeah. So back, back to your work and your clients. The, the stereotype is that your clients are powerful businessmen that are older than you. Yeah. Quite a bit older. I mean... um, one thing I can say about submissives is I don't think there's a demographic. You can't just be like... It's not a, it's not a man who's got a powerful position at work yeah. and then he needs to counter Which, that somehow. Of course, sex work is a luxury. Um, you know, most of us aren't, you know, cheap, especially if you are wanting to see someone regularly. Like, you have to have the income to be able to sustain that. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I've had some people who... They make less, but they really want to be able to explore this part of themselves because I think it's also very just easy to stumble upon BDSM porn and find, you know, some interest in that. I mean, I think at the end of the day, anything can make us aroused. Um, and so they get curious and the, something sparked their interest and... Nothing makes me happier than seeing someone who's never done this before and go to a professional because it's just, it's so much better than just fumbling around with someone who doesn't know what they're doing, especially because 
there are aspects of BDSM that are dangerous. And as a dom, I'm taking on responsibility and making sure that I am, you know, prioritizing my safety and also their safety. Um, and if you're seeing someone who hasn't done this before and is also like, hey, I watched this video, like, can we kind of do that? And the other person has no idea what they're doing, um, especially because I will always stand by this, but like the best porn is always behind a paywall because anything that is in Pornhub most of the time it is being actually, it's actually advertising for someone else's content, um, like long form content. Um, so it's really, you know, you're just getting bits and pieces. And a lot of the times you're getting this like gimmicky kind of BDSM stuff. It's not very natural, it's not very authentic. Um, and there are definitely people who want that. Those are not my clients. I prefer to see people who, you know, really enjoy the lifestyle and maybe can't engage in it 24 seven or some people who do engage in it 24 seven, um, but particularly like my style of domination. And that's why they, they choose to see me over someone else. Um, but yeah, it just makes me so happy to see someone who's not done this before and choose to see a professional because I think it's just, it sets you up to have one of the best experiences that you could um, as an initial like introduction into BDSM. So um, again, that's it's very rewarding for me to be C able communication to Communication is a, is a huge component in all this. It's it? huge. I mean, whenever I have, for example, if I have a client and we are on the phone um, talking about all of these things, like what we want to engage in, and they can't properly communicate to me like what they want, um, I won't see them. Like I'm not interested in someone who's like, oh, you do what you want, because that is something that I can take the lead on with someone that I've known for a while and I understand their limits very well, I understand their interests very well, and I understand maybe some of those soft limits that I can push a little bit. Um, and you know maybe get them introduced into some other kinks that are adjacent to their other kinks because you have um, a prior relationship with them exactly but if i've never met them before um i think we can never assume that someone is into um like certain echelons like for example if someone tells me they're into med fet, like which is medical fetish you'd think that that is something fairly extreme but for example, that person might not be into, let's say, bondage, which for a lot of people might seem as something kind of beginner. Again, you just, you can't assume that there are like tears um, because everyone has different triggers. Everyone has different experiences, um, especially if you had prior experiences in BDSM with someone who didn't know what they're doing. Um, like, I just don't know what they did that might have set off that person and makes them uncomfortable. And that immediately takes them out of subspace which is just the worst thing I think that can happen in a session. Um, but it's just so, so, so important to be communicative because if you leave something out and I happen to do that, like I want to immediately go into aftercare. Um, and if they're not communicating that, like I won't know that. And the last thing you want is to traumatize a client. Like, I mean, that's, that's just terrifying. What, what, what advice can you give to women about their relationships with, with men, um, sexual or otherwise? Yeah, I think it's really important to find what makes you confident and just not sacrifice that whenever you are in a relationship because I think sometimes people settle or they compromise. And I think that there are just certain things in your life that you cannot compromise on. And um, yeah, it's difficult because they're obviously within my within my industry, like I'm dealing with a lot of people who do objectify me. Um, but you just need to be able to pick out who is and who isn't and who's authentic. And at the end of the day, I understand that I am a pretty woman, um, but also like I'm providing the service that I think is really invaluable to a lot of people. Um, and I think if someone doesn't see the value in that, then, you know, I wouldn't want to be able, I, I wouldn't want to see them. So I think for any, any woman who is interested in exploring their dominance and their power, like I think it's a really wonderful thing to explore.
whether or not that's something you do on a regular basis or um, you get into this as a lifestyle like I do, obviously this is an extreme, um, but you know, I find so much happiness in it. And I know that there are a ton of other women who um, might be a little bit nervous about engaging in it, especially when we live in a society that doesn't exactly reward us for being powerful and being able to express our confidence in the way that I do. Um, so. Is, is some of what your makeup is, is, is from the fact that women are tend to p play a submissive role um, in society? I think so. I, I think I've always been somewhat of a rebel. And so when I started seeing people viewing me as submissive, like I just immediately went the opposite direction because I was like, that is not me. And no one has ever described me as that. Um, and I think a lot of people tend to put their fantasies onto people um, without really understanding um, what that other person is like or into. So, yeah, I think a lot of it came from the fact that women are supposed to be submissive. So I was like, that's not me. Um, and like, I don't consider myself to be a switch. Like I am very much dominant both in like lifestyle practice and professionally. Um, although I do engage in like some vanilla acts as well um, because we're all human and enjoy sex, but. It's interesting how there's so many little sub mm -hmm. groups in, in sex. I know, and I, I think about that all the time. Just on my channel, you can see about 30 of them. Exactly. Or, or more. Yeah, um, and something that I like to do is I like to be able to explore BDSM as a dominant and maybe introduce some things that, some particular kinks or acts that might be seen as submissive and do it in a dominant way and just get people to really reevaluate their, re their relationship with sexuality and BDSM and be like, oh, okay, you can actually apply that in any way. At the end of the day, it's about the dynamic, not about that particular kink you're engaging in, right? Like you don't have to put someone on a collar and leash and like just call it BDSM, right? Like you could just, there's so much you can do. Um, and it's really fun to explore those dynamics. And I'm sure there's clients of yours that don't want sex at all. Yeah, like I said, I've, I've tried to offer it multiple times um, to people that I'm comfortable with and they're like, no thanks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I find that, um, kind of amusing um they just really enjoy the, the dynamic that i offer and whenever they think about that like sometimes it's almost like i don't even want to think about you in that context they're like i just want to see you as this person who is above me and better than me um which is obviously a really interesting dynamic the world is fascinating i know um but majority of the times truly submissive um men in particular they they really don't have an interest in it. Like they are so enamored by BDSM that that is just the path that they want to take. That's all they want. Yeah, that's all they want. Um, and I think a lot of the times something that I engage in in particular is like conditioning and getting people to, you know, get a certain reaction out of things that I do. And I, I love being able to do that. Like I love being able to reward people for certain acts and then um, you know punish them for other acts. Um, yeah, I've definitely rewired some men's brains, um, but obviously consensually. But what do your female friends think of what you do? Um, most of my friends are sex workers. Oh, is that right? Yeah, most most of them. Um, anyone who's not. Um, is also very like sexually liberal um whether they are submissive themselves or not or just very vanilla um i think particularly living in new york like it's very common for people to be really open about these things mm -hmm. and especially given the fact that i've lived in london and new york like bdsm is very common like people talk about it you hear people talking about it on the street you hear people talking about it you know at even a restaurant at times um this is something i'm very open about and i think a lot of metropolitan cities are as well um or they're very kinky or they have a kink scene right i mean if you go into the middle of like 
Not right. like New York, though. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> New York City is the best, right? New York City is the best. Um, I do really love it here. But, you know, if you go into some, like, rural town, like, you know, it's obviously going to be seen as a lot more deviant. Um, and I'm very thankful to surround myself around a lot of people who are supportive and accepting of what I do. Um, and even as far as understand it. Um, because I think there's a lot of what we do that people are just like, I don't really get it, but okay, you know? Um, and it's not for everyone, and I don't think BDSM should be mainstream, and I don't think people should be... Absolutely um, not. No, of course not, because that's when you have, you know, like, for example, uh, high schoolers choking out partners and things like that. Like, that's, that's terrifying. It should not be mainstream at all. Um, that's where communication comes in. Exactly. Um, and that's also something that we really need to educate anyone who's having sex or um, just engaging in anything remotely sexual is just to communicate to your partners like what you like, what you don't like, what you can and can't do. You just you can't really assume anything. Um, and that's why I think also BDSM is really important to me and the fact that we have negotiation, like we are able to talk about what might happen during the scene, what your limits are, what your interests are, what your kinks are prior to engaging in a scene. So I come as well prepared as possible because I just don't want to put someone in an uncomfortable position. Like that would just, it would make me awful. It made me feel awful. Like, and I really, really, really care about my submissives. Um, and it's something that I, I don't know if every Tom feels that way, but like, I do really love them. Um, even the people who I don't see very often, I just, I do really want the best for them because this is obviously something that is very deviant for the majority of the population. So I want to be able to bring validation to those people. However, I do believe in kink shaming. So <laughs> like, I think because if, they're into it. No, no, not necessarily. I just mean, if someone's engaging in something unethical, Oh, I see. I am more than happy to be like, I don't even know what kink shame is. What is kink shame? Like shaming someone for having a particular kink, which I think a lot of the times, um, like it's guised as this like, oh, we don't, you know, like make fun of people for what they like. But I think if someone is like being like, oh, I'm into bestiality, like, no, we are going to shame them for that. That is not a good thing to do. Oh, I see. Um, because there's a lot of people who are into particular kinks, but in reality, it's just something unethical. Um, and like, I would never um, enable someone to engage in something, um, especially if it's hurting someone else in a non-consensual way, just like obviously children, animals can't consent. Um, but yeah, I'm more than happy to hurt someone consensually. <laughs> yeah. And Dasha, what would you say is the most important thing you've learned in your 22 years and your four years of doing this crazy stuff? Yeah. Um, I think the most important thing that I've learned is um, to trust yourself and my gut. I, it's really never let me down. And thankfully, I've never been in dangerous situations within this industry. And I think that comes from just trusting myself and my ability to understand people, which I think is hyper aware compared to other people. Um, and I'm very thankful for that and I, tr I trust myself wholeheartedly um, and yeah like I always tell myself to trust past Dasha like if for example I'm wondering if I lock the door I'm like no I did because I know that I trust myself to like do all these things um, and so I just I always trust my gut um, and I think that a woman's intuition is just like a superpower <laughs> <laughs> yes it is yeah all right, Dasha, thank you so much for of sharing course. your story. Very fascinating. Thank you.